We are so excited that you've joined us today. You're about to hear a message from our pastor, Mike McFadder from the Crossing Worship Center. Please make sure you are following us on YouTube and Facebook. We pray that this message draws you closer to the Lord and encourages you. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23. And the very God of peace. That's who God is. The very God of peace. Sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body, that's what you are, your spirit, soul, and body, be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is, my, this is my key verse, one of the key verses. Faithful is he that calleth you, and who will also do it. That's important this morning because what I want you to know is a lot of our struggles is because we're still trying to do it. We, we know he's faithful, but we're concerned about our own unfaithfulness. What bothers us as true Christians, because if it doesn't bother you, then I would check my Christianity because when I was not saved, I didn't care what I thought. I, I wanted to do what I wanted. I wasn't blaming myself for anything. When you're not saved, you don't blame yourself for anything. You are your own God and you love yourself. Anybody remember those days when you looked in the mirror and you said, mm -hmm. that's the dude right there. That's, that's, the, that's, that's it. I, I mean, we dress ourselves up. That's what we do. But when you become a Christian, the very thing you begin to see is how holy Jesus is and how unholy you are. That is by design. That is by design because the problem for humanity is, is that we're trying to be our own God. And if you don't see your own weaknesses, you can't see God for who he's supposed to be. God is faithful. This morning, I know you sit in your trouble. I know you're in mess. I get where you are. Believe me, I understand the frustrations and the problems of living these days and the evil that is around us and the struggles that happen. But God wanted me to bring to you this morning. I want you to know that I am faithful. And listen, I will do it for you. That's the new covenant. I want us to look at it a little bit this morning. God is absolutely a God of relationships. Matter of fact, God demands relationships. God demands that you and I be in relationship with Him. My title this morning, my title for you is, Lord, teach us your faithfulness. You are going to have, and I have to learn that he's faithful. He has to teach us that I'm going to come through for you. You're going to have to learn that as a principle because everything that has to do with who we are, we learn from a very early age and we mature. That's the whole concept of a human being. It's what you don't know now. Once you know it can mature you. You learn that the principles of what is involved in life, two plus two is always what? It's always four. Thank you. It doesn't matter where you are. But if they ever change the program and two plus two now is five, you've confused everybody. This is what's going on in modern religion. Modern religion changed the dynamics and said two and two, not four anymore. It's two and a half. What happens is, is when we do that, the concepts that we now teach, if you don't like it, then you don't accept it. So now we pick and choose what we believe. Think about all the denominations. I'm not here to talk about that this morning. All of the denominations that are available are not because this word is flawed. It is because man's concepts, his interpretation of it. And I pray that you interpret it right because your eternal life depends on it. Where you're going to spend forever, folks, the fact that you're even in church is a work in the power of the Holy Ghost to woo you here. There's nothing about God that a man's loss has any desire of. So if you've come to this place where now you're sitting here interested in what God has to say, you have to know the Spirit of God has helped you and dealt with you somewhere. 
And he's dealing with others they just have not answered yet. So do you have the relationship? What is, what's going on in your relationship? Psalms 25 and 14, relationships are always based off an agreement. Any kind of relationship, isn't there just some things that are expected? Whether it's a friendship, whether it's a sibling, whether it's a mom and a child, whether it's a husband and a spouse, two friends, whatever it might be. Isn't there some, just some things that are expected? They're not, they're not have to talk. We don't have to give each other a list. Okay, if you're going to be my friend... I need you to do these things. Now, after a while, we all find our friends are needy, aren't they? Huh? But the Bible says, do unto others as you would have them do to you. So the concepts of relationships is that it's only as good as the party is faithful. You ever lost a friendship? God knows we've, our, our world is inundated with divorce. We once said we love you. We once said it's wonderful. And we said this is powerful and we want to stay together forever. Only to find ourselves falling out of love. That didn't work out. The list wasn't done right. We didn't fall. All of this happened. So we change it in for a new model. <laughs> and find out that the X model's flawed too. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? After a while, it's just all flawed, isn't it? Have you ever run into a human being that wasn't flawed? <laughs> if you do, let me know, because I, I, I think sometimes that's the way we act. We act like maybe everybody else has got their act together, but I don't have mine. And that's what the devil does to a young Christian. I got my act. You just don't have your act together. I remember the enemy telling me, you're not like them. You're not like them. And I had to listen. I had to learn. I had to be taught what God was like. You have to learn God's ways. You have to know, would God say that to you? Is what you're hearing God's voice, another man's voice, or the voice of the enemy? Have you ever heard the statement, sometimes we are our own worst? Mm, not great friends. Sometimes you can be your worst enemy. What is that? I'm thinking wrong. I was telling them, one of the young Christians here this morning. I said, I can't move you till I can change the way you think. And Jesus says... The fear or the power I have in myself. You should see the awe of the God that you are serving. You had not seen God lately if you're still worried about you. You're in the hands of God. You don't see Him faithful. We're still looking in the mirror and going, we're flawed. We're flawed. We're flawed and I don't like me or I don't like this situation. And that's what causes us to have a problem. Relationships are only as good as the promises made by the person. You can promise me anything. It's a piece of paper. It doesn't matter anything, does it? If it's broken, and people don't mind breaking promises, do they? Did I say human beings cannot keep the promises they made to you? I have made some promises to my children, and I've told them I will always be there for you. Is that true? As good as I want to be, brother, as much as I want to, there are just some things I cannot help my kids with. But I promised them. But you're promising from a flawed position. You're promising from a position that you, you just wanted them to have comfort for a moment. You wanted to give them peace for a moment when you can't give the peace. God has to give the peace. Where are we this morning in our walk with the Lord? The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him. Now that word fear is not translated as of um, death. It means awe and reverence and respect. It means you've seen God for who He wants you to see Him as. And He will show them His what? His promises or His covenant. God wants you to know there's a covenant. The actual testament means covenant. You are in covenant with God right now. Do you know what the covenant says? 
Have you read the details of your contract with God? This is very important, church. That's why I want to stop and just kind of say it to us again. Refresh our mind. What does the covenant say or the contract say that's between you and God? You have to learn what that means or you're going to always live doubting God. God is not like you. Aren't you glad? He doesn't have bad days. He's not overwhelmed by the attacks of the enemy. Matter of fact, he's already defeated the enemy. So what does the contract say between you and God? It means that you will never, ever, ever be able to please me in yourself. That's what the whole old covenant said. The old contract said, you have to do this or you're in violation of God. And you look back in the Old Testament, you'll see where God was very difficult on those who did not obey him. Now, obedience, lack of obedience still has consequences, but I'm talking about contract. I'm talking about what establishes who we are and who we're following. So every time my wife and I may have a spout or an argument or disagreement, does that take us out of contract? Obviously not. There are a couple of things that can remove you from the contract. These things, let's just use the one. If you divorce was never accepted unless there was a breaking of the covenant. Thou shalt not commit adultery. You can't be in covenant with two separate parties. Are you hearing me? What does that mean to my spiritual life? You cannot be loyal to the world that God set you free from and still be loyal to the God that now is in contract with you. This is the problem. We want to live two lives. It never works. It's never going to work. You're in contract with two different people expecting two different things out of you. I remember when I got saved, and I'd been running pretty hard before that, and so I got saved on a Sunday, and by the next Friday, all the buddies showed back up with the Bronco, and they're saying, hey, we're ready to go to the beach again. But I had been now changed and been in contract with God. So he said, if you love the world... It's not, to, it's not to be ugly or, 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 or imposing to you. He's saying the secret of the Lord is that when you're in contract or in covenant with God, understand you should have seen something that blew your mind. You should be in awe of the God you're in covenant with. I don't see much awe. Out of the church. I don't, I don't see much awe or fear or, or, or respect or appreciation. But nonetheless, listen to me, nonetheless, that doesn't break contract. Even though you and I are flawed, even though we still do wrong, even though there are things that we hate about our own self, you know what God said? I kind of expect that out of you. Matter of fact, I've already seen you do that for many, many years. And so I knew that you couldn't do it. But yet I'm God and I demand holiness. And I still demand perfection. God has not changed, church. That's why you have to, as a Christian, consistently grow in your Christian life. That means to become more consistent with knowledge about who God is. If you will follow the Lord and be committed to Him, you will grow in your knowledge of God and He will teach you how to please Him. Teach us the secrets, God, of living free. Teach us the part about resting in the contract. Are you resting in the covenant of God, which is Jesus Christ? His blood is the stamp of approval on your life. 
Not your prayer life. Not your attendance. Pastor sometimes pushes attendance because I know you're not going to get this out there. And I know what you're getting out there. Complete lies. That's why this church, if I felt anything from the Spirit of the Lord, it is that this church and churches like this absolutely have to be in existence. There is no true light much anymore. I preached a message one time to a youth camp, and I took all the lights out, and eventually, before it was all over with, I had taken every light out of the room except one little lantern that I had. It had a little flickering, a little flickering uh, a flame in it, and it gave just enough light that we could vaguely see each other. And I was trying to illustrate to the children or the young people that, hey, there's no real light. Light is getting more and more dim not this light, folks. I'm not talking about the light to see me and you sitting in a chair. I'm talking about the light of truth and the gospel. That if you're lost in darkness, how are you going to get to the place where you're saved? What he was saying is, is there's not many ways anymore, places for a person to get truly saved. You say, Pastor, you want me to question my salvation? No, I want you to check it. I just want you to look at it again. Bring the contract back out. Let's talk about the covenant made between God and you. And the only answer is Jesus Christ. He is the contract. So how do I live free when I'm flawed? How am I ever going to be able To please a God that demands holiness. And I hear it and probably have said it myself. You know those messages that you preach that are hellfire and brimstone. I mean when we preach about sin and the consequences of it. You know what has happened over those thousands of years when preachers even myself at times, you know what happens when we preach the, that truth of the difficulty of sin in a man's life? You know what happened? Millions have come to the Lord. <laughs> Millions have walked the aisles to the altar because somebody said, you're going to hell if you don't change. And then you realize I can't change. That's a beautiful place to be. It's, it's, well, how do I get saved? There's a new contract. That's the good news, folks. You don't have to bring a turtle dove or a bullock this morning. That's the old contract. But I'm going to tell you something. The sin you commit all week long and I commit has to be answered for. It is no less important to God. The only thing now is, is that the blood of Jesus has been shed for the remission of those sins. Come on, that's exciting. Why does it that make the church shout anymore? Why don't we get excited about that instead of the healing of the cancer? That God's saying to you this morning, I want to teach you I am faithful when you are not. My character is faithful. Your character is flawed. And if you look at yourself, you will never rest. Did you know there's a rest in the Lord? That you're supposed to be resting in the Lord. What does that mean? Go home, get in the recliner, say, hallelujah. We make all kinds of noises when we sleep, don't we? Remember the three stooges? Don't remember all that? Some of these kids are like three stooges. Believe me, there's a guy out there that looks just like Pastor. And there's... As a Christian, being in a place of anointing and leadership doesn't change me thinking sometimes more highly of myself than I should. The more you mature, the more you're going to believe you kind of got it going on now. And the enemy loves it and will set you up. And I saw one this morning I didn't even read. I just, it was a little article. Uh, mega pastor, mega church, something. Made them sign a contract about uh, 
relationships in the church. You know, homosexual relationships. He, it was a contract the pastor wanted him to sign, something I didn't even read what it was. But the media got a hold of that. So you want me to put my name on this line that says, I believe this? Why is that offensive to the world out there? I've already done that. This is my... <laughs> Folks, this is the Word. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among... This is Jesus. And there's, listen to me, you, you as a contract with him, no. Speak for Jesus sometimes when they say he's an old meanie. When they, say to you, when they say to you that I don't want to serve the Lord because why would Jesus put anybody in hell? Come on, church. You Come on, redeemed people. Why, why do we not speak up and say, hang on a minute. That's not what the contract says. The contract says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That, that whosoever, he don't care what your creed is, your background. I don't care what your sin was, murder, pedophile, abuse. I don't care what it is. Homosexuality, pornography, I don't care. You have never gone too far that I won't come into contract with you. I want to be in contract. Matter of fact, the contract of the word says, the stipulations say that I love you even though you were somebody that didn't love me. But what they don't like about the contract is that when I go into signing it, you have to sign as well. Just simply saying, I will put my faith in this contract whose name is Jesus. And I will not suffer that to be taken from me. I won't compromise it. I won't commit adultery on him. I will not run from him. I will not go back on him. I will do as he said. I am in contract with him. And they don't like that. The world says, well, I, I, I don't like, you should accept me as we are. Well, the Bible says that if you're still who you are, you're not saved. You have to be born again, Nicodemus. The man he told that to was standing there in the garb of religion thinking he was saved. But he hadn't got into the new contract. He was still living. By the old contract. And you can't have it both ways. Right? I'm going to move quickly to my points. Ezekiel chapter 18. So skipping a few verses here. Chapters. We have tried too long to live an overcoming life through our own ability. I'm going to say it again. We have lived too long trying to overcome through our own abilities. Now the story I'm going to read to you is about this prophet Ezekiel, and he is dealing with God's people. This is an Old Testament story, but it is a New Testament covenant. You'll see it in a second. This is the story about Ezekiel and God, and Ezekiel has come into a place where he is now in a covenant with God. He is God's mouthpiece. Now, sometimes a man like Ezekiel, even though Jesus had not come yet, had gotten the concept of what grace really was. But he was still kind to figure out how can God hate sin and still love sinners? That's kind of the principle. We are the people of God, yet we're still sinning. Is that, that's still true, isn't it? I said, we're the people of God, yet we still commit sin. But does it bother you? Should. Now, he's, here we go. He said, therefore, now this is what he's saying. Therefore, here's Ezekiel. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways. Now, you want to go back to the old covenant? That's the old covenant. Everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord God, repent and do what? That has not changed. There is no salvation without turning. Listen to me, Christian, old or young. You cannot remain the same and be saved. You have to turn from your ways and go the other way. That is true repentance. Repentance is not accepting Jesus and still living like the world. 
Turn, listen, yourselves from your transgressions. This, see, now this is the prophet telling God's people this. He's speaking for God. So iniquity shall not be your ruin. Have you heard that message? Has anybody here? I come from, man, I've been, I've been raised in church. I counted the other day I, men that actually were considered in my life, pastors in my life. I think I was, I was my brother's here. Was like, I think I was like nine that we've had over I could call their names. Nine people, pastors, different, different things. So now this man's saying something, and he says that your transgressions turn from them. Turn yourself from them, lest they be your ruin. ruin. I mean, they're doing it, and he can't figure out why they're doing it. I mean, Ezekiel's going, why, why do you continue to sin and expect something different? He's telling them. He said, why are you sin, or you, you have this place in your life that you won't give to God, and then you expect God to ignore it, and he doesn't ignore it, and your life falls into ruin. Have you ever been there? Have you ever done something wrong and you knew it was wrong and you did it again and it was easier the second time? And then you do it again and it's easier the third time? And then after a while it's just justified and you go find your scripture so you can tell everybody else? Why are you still justified? You're in love with the world and the world is your enemy or is an enemy God? You can't love the world and God too. You have to hate the one and love the other. Matter of fact, he gets right down to it. He said, if you love your kids more than me, you're not worthy of me. I didn't say your spouse because we can throw them out now. I'm talking about if you love your youngins more than me, you, not, you don't love me enough. You hadn't seen me. And so that's what he said. He said, cast away from you. You cast away from you your transgression, whereby they transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit for thy will, uh, for, for for why will you die, O house of Israel? Cast away, for I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live. Have you tried that? How did that work? But he's drawing a distinction. The man's preaching the gospel. And I'm telling you that we have seen millions of people saved by preaching that's hold them over the flames of hell. And I'm talking about they packed to the altar to get saved. Now, I'm not saying that that is, that is, the, that is the principle of the new covenant. But I am saying that there has to be something said for that truth that there is a consequence of not being truly saved. How many people are sitting on pews of churches that they're not truly saved because somebody told them they didn't have to repent? I'm telling you, i got books in my office that says that repentance is no longer necessary. Huge name, people. For I have no pleasure in them. Now, here's the thing. So he's, he's baffled. Why do they don't stop? I, you know, as a preacher, I think I've done that. Why don't they stop doing that? You ever thought that about one of your loved ones? Don't you know that if you do that again, the same thing's going to happen. Think about a drug addict. Don't you just go, what in the world is so high that you would sell everything you have and to get high? To look at an alcoholic and say, why do you keep drinking? And we said that before. Why do you think it's going to be your ruin? That's what we tell him, isn't it? And it's true. We tell him it's going to be your ruin. And Ezekiel's host said, why don't you stop? Why don't you stop? The truth of the matter is, is they don't have the power to stop. It's impossible for you to not sin in your humanity. Pastor, what do we do? It's a scripture I have. I actually signed this when I signed letters, a piece of this. It's in Zechariah 4 and 6. It's one of my favorite scriptures, not my most favorite scripture, because it is the transition between what's going to help you this morning and what you're going to leave out of here still hurting and confused about why you are in such ruin 
And then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, It's not by your efforts. It's not by your power. You can't man up and make this happen. You're not going to turn over a new leaf. You're not going to suck it up, and I'm going to do what's right. I'm telling you, I'm going to prophesy to you, you ain't going to make it. You might live right for six months. You might live right for a year. You might do everything you think you're going to do. But there's going to become a time and a pressure get on you. A temptation is going to come back when you least expect it. Do you know temptation? Listen to me. Something I heard. I got, I've got put it in my spirit. Temptation has to be attractive or it's not a temptation. Hmm? I have never been tempted by a salad. <laughs> never, brother. I've eaten a few of them. I like them. But I've never said, mm, I just, oh, my God, there's my vice, a salad. I'm going to have to eat that thing. Oh, God. It's never been distracted to me now. A good, hot, crispy cream, hot right now. That sign, they know what that little flashing sign is. That they, you've seen it. Everybody in here is looking over there to see if they're hot. Because you can eat a hot one in one bite. Now, ain't you, it'll, like, fold up and mm. No, my goodness. See, but if it's not, if it don't have that mm, factor, it's not temptation. So what is your temptation? What is your mmm? I'd like to have that. That ain't never going away. I've been saved 50 years. I said it's never going away. You still have to know your susceptible things. What you get are susceptible to is not what I'm susceptible to. I, I've never had a drug that I wanted so bad I'd sell my house for. But I'm telling you, they are everywhere. Now, here's the thing. You are not going to live a Christian life without the Spirit. You are trying it in your own efforts. And I'm going to tell you this morning that you need to start saying to the Holy Ghost, I need you today to help me live this covenant with Jesus because I can't do it in myself. Are you with me this morning? The unbelievable truth, Zechariah 36, when he said this, that by my spirit, then will I sprinkle clean water upon them and you shall be clean for all of your filthiness from all of your idols will what? I cleanse you. A new heart, God says, I will give you. A new spirit I will put within you. I will take away the stony heart of your flesh, and I will give you a heart. Listen, that word flesh there means to turn out to be sensitive. You're going to go from insensitive to sensitive. You're going to go from not broken, couldn't, I'm not crying, to a broken heart. When I got saved, I, <laughs> I cried all up. Because God took out that old stony heart and gave me a new heart. Does anybody remember when God gave you a new heart and you started really loving Jesus? You don't know why, but all of a sudden you were ready to go to church. You love God. And it wasn't for long you got back in the car with you or in the room with you. Started telling you how sorry you are and your prayer life's not right. And you're no good and you don't want to go to church and you're not like them. Matter of fact, you still want that pornography. You still want that drug. You still want that drink. And that voice goes over and over and over and over. And after a while you said, I really do like that drug. I really would like to look at the pornography again. I really have. Oh, my God. I'm not a Christian at all. No, that's an absolute normal thing that the enemy pushes against your flesh to make you want what you used to want so you break covenant with him. That the contract's not that easy to break because the contract's not, not made on your faithfulness. I'm not in contract with you because you can. I'm in contract because with you because I can. I'm not in contract with you because you're faithful. I'm in contract with you because I always am faithful. And I want to teach you that again, church. I want you to know, thus saith God. I want you to know I'm in contract with you because I'm faithful, not you're faithful. You have to know. Hebrews 10, 23, that God's promise is to be faithful to you. Is only based off of his truth. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. You want to know how to hang on tomorrow? Look in the mirror and say, I don't trust you. <laughs> I'm putting my faith in God. 
And he's always faithful. Now, what does Ezekiel do at the end of this? Ezekiel 37. So he's tried to figure out why don't they quit sinning because it continues to create ruin in their life. Ezekiel 37, 1 through 3. And the hand of the Lord was upon me. And he kept, this is what he's trying to tell the prophet. I'm going to show you something. So he takes the man upon me, carried me in the spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. He's giving Ezekiel a picture of what it means to be saved. Never seen this before. And caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? I want to ask you, can your neighbor who's lost be saved? I want to ask you, can you be saved? Because when it looks like there's no way, when it looks like there's such a dryness to who you are. And he said, I answered and said, oh, Lord, you know. That was the correct answer. He said, you know. I don't know. (laughs) Can these bones live? I'm going to ask you, is there a place for you to live free? It is impossible for you to live free, clean or faithful, without God. Without the Holy Ghost, you can't do it. The only thing about this is verse 4 through 6. And so God answers him and says, and again I'm just saying to you, listen to me, prophesy unto the bones and say unto them, Oh, you dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. <laughs> well, that's what I preach to myself lately. Because if I've ever felt Backed up, backslid, broke down, messed up, and dry as a powder house. It's kind of a place I've been walking in for the last few months. I feel like, my God, am I saved? Everybody around me staring at me, wondering if I'm saved or not. Like the man that had to halt harm. Is it he that sinned or his family? Which is it that sinned? Because surely you have failed God, because that's what you're going through. Why, everybody else was on the mountaintop, seeing like Brother Mike went down in the valley. And everybody looked down in the valley and said, I don't understand why he's not in revival. I don't understand why he's in a mess. And I get down here and God said if I can't show you, I can't show them. So I got to show you something first, preacher. I want you to know something, Ezekiel. You're looking at dry bones and I asked you a question. Can they live? And you said, only you know that, God. And he said back to him, behold, I will cause breath to enter into him. I will cause him. I said, I will cause you to live. You're not going to live this life unless he calls is you too. Come on, somebody. I said, you're not going to live this life until he starts and I will lay sinew upon you and I will bring up flesh upon you and I will cover you with skin and put the breath in you and you shall live. Come on, do you remember the day God spoke to you at an altar and you said, Lord, forgive me, and he breathed on you and you got up a new man and now you're saved and you love God and you don't know why all of a sudden the dry bones began to skin and the sinew and what happened to them? They began to live. But they weren't free. They were alive, but they weren't free. Ezekiel 7, 37, 7. Listen to what he said, do. So, prophet, so prophesy what I command you. I said, prophesy what? I'm telling you, brethren, if you don't have this, you're not a man of God. You don't know what George needs. You need to be able to hear what God tells you what George needs. God said, you look at it, but you don't know what you're supposed to say. Let me tell you what you need to say. And he said, I prophesied, and there was a noise, and behold, a shaking. And the bones came together, and the bone to bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and skin covered them above. And there was no, there was no breath in them. The breath of God's what brought you out of the dirt. But there was no breath in them yet. And then he said to him, prophesy to the wind. Anytime you see wind, that's Holy Ghost. Are you with me? Listen to me. I said every time you see wind, it's the Holy Ghost. When you see wind, when God's talking about it, it's the Holy Ghost. Now, the devil has a, term, a counterfeit for all of it, counterfeit for all of it. But this he's saying, you say to the Holy Ghost, thus saith the Lord God. If the Holy Ghost is listening for anything, it's what God said. 
You say, well, that don't make sense. I'm telling you what he told the prophet. You say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds. The Bible says in the New Testament that the wind listeth where it will. It comes from the north, the south, the east, and the west. You don't know where it's coming from. That's the Holy Ghost. He said, from the four winds, O breath, breathe upon these slain that they may live. Now, you can be alive this morning and not free. Please hear me. This is the end of the message. Climax to this point. And the breath came into them, and they lived. I said the breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet. There is something about God's concepts that he has to do for you. None of this was anything the dry bones could do. None of this could they do by themselves. I want to look at this verse 8 again. But there was no breath in them. There was no life in them they had stood upon their feet they had gotten the skin back but there was no holy spirit power in them to keep them and to move them and he said i will prophesy and i will say to them that you might live i'm going to tell you i'm going to make you live church This was the whole new covenant in the Old Testament. Ezekiel was staring at what Jesus was about to do. You cannot resurrect yourself. You cannot live right by yourself any more than you can save yourself. And if you're going to live right in the way you want to according to the covenant, you're going to have to have the Holy Ghost as your guide and as your lead. There will not be another way for you to do it. You will have to let the Spirit of the Lord make you, keep you, and teach you how to live. When is the last time that you prophesied to the Holy Ghost? When is the last time you spoke to the Holy Ghost and said, Thus saith God, arise within me and keep me this day, that I don't go about my own business, but that I follow God's rules and God's ways and God's concepts the best I can according to the power of the Holy Ghost. How am I going to live free? Because the Holy Ghost is going to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. He said prophesy or ask. Speak to the Holy Ghost. Why then do we not live free? We repent and repeat. Repent and repeat. Repent and repeat. Isn't that exhausting? It's not only exhausting for me and you, it's exhausting for the power of the Holy Spirit. It's just, what is this? So what do I do? Things have to change. It's not the activity that you have to do. It's that you have to depend upon the Lord. And what's struggling, what you're struggling with right now is that you're not able to overcome because you're not able to do it without the Holy Ghost. And so what you're trying to do is your own self trying to save yourself again, trying to get yourself out of a mess, trying to stop doing what you're doing without prophesying or speaking to the Holy Ghost and saying, I need your help today, Lord. You're in here for a reason. Help me get up. Help me live right. The contract. Can I tell you again that the covenant is not easily broken? If it was going to be so easily broken, it would be every time you had a bad thought. Every time you did something wrong. Because if you broke one law in the Old Testament, you broke them all. Thank you for listening. And don't forget to follow us on YouTube and Facebook so you don't miss out on any future content from the Crossing Worship Center. Thank you again and God bless.